Well, I've been praying lately, guys, about what the Lord wanted to speak this morning because I try to do that um, before I come up here. Because I believe that God inspires His words and His voice and what He wants to speak to us. So, I mean, anybody can pull something out of Scripture. It will be His Word. But rather it be specifically what He wanted. So, let's pray before we speak. Lord Jesus, I just ask right now, and Father, by Your Spirit, that You would speak to our hearts, Lord, that it would be something that would draw us, God, that it would be something that would quicken us deep inside, Lord, that we would not be the same. Because Your Word is alive. It is living. It is not dead. It is not ink on a page. And Lord, I pray that Your love would speak the truth to our hearts, Jesus. Everybody said, Amen. Is everybody okay today? Everybody good? Okay, good. Look, this is what the Lord spoke to my heart. I was praying. I said, Lord, what do you want to speak? And there's been a lot of things on my mind and my heart. I'm a thinker. Thus, the loss of hair. No, I'm just picking. I'm picking. I, I do think a lot, y'all. I'm, I'm 28 years old. Matter of fact, yesterday I had my birthday. I'm 28 years old. And, uh, you know, a lot of things I've gone through. A lot of things I've experienced. A lot more to experience. And I just, I think a lot. I just think about a lot of things. I think about situations and perspectives and, and different things in life. So, that being said, I recognize what's going on in the world around us. I mean, watch the news, talk to you guys and girls at work, you know, different things along those lines, and just like, wow, what is really going on? You know, and it's, wow, this thing is, is kind of echoing. Um, but needless to say, it's, you know, there's a lot of things that just caught my heart and just caught my mind. It's like, man, God, what is going on in the world? I mean, come on, y'all. We can see and recognize the state of the world, you know, the, the wars and the fights and the famines and the murders. I mean, here in our own city, I mean, it's just like, wow. Every night, our cops, man, I hope you guys lift them up. I've got a lot of friends on the force. And what they go through to keep us safe, man, is amazing. And they put up with a lot of wickedness. And I'm thankful for every one of them. And I was like, Lord, what's going on? Where are we at? What is happening in 2012, this, this date that we are in history? And you know, if you research history any, if you research it any and just look back over it, all right, whether in just topical studies or if you really get in depth on certain areas you know, that happened, there's patterns to societies. There's patterns to history. It's they'll be going great, okay, and then all of a sudden they begin to falter and fall and they fail. They go on great, and they start to falter and then they fail. Well, I believe in God's word. I believe in this thing. I believe that it is it is more than just a book written by man. I believe it was word spoken by God. Okay. A lot of people say, hey, you know, the Bible, I don't believe that thing. It was written by a man. And I look at them and say, you're exactly right. Unless books started magically appearing, somebody wrote them. But I said, who spoke it is what matters. Turn to Second Chronicles 7.14 for me, please. And I've got a couple other scripture references we'll be turning to. Or you can just write these down and look them up later. So I begin to say, Lord, what is going on? What is going on in our society? What is going on in our church? What is going on in our government? Okay? What is going on, God? What is going on? I mean, you read every day. I mean, I, I read it. I have a lot of updates of news and, and activity uh, going on in the world, in America. All it comes on my Facebook. So I get alerts all day. And it's like a consistent alert, consistent news flash. Oh, this one banning prayer, and, and this one hating God, and this one, you know, this, that, and the other, you know. And, and it's craziness in my mind, but it's going on. You know, no more prayer in schools, okay? This one's offended because this one said the Pledge of Allegiance because it had God in it. or I mean, it's crazy stuff. I get it all day long. I read it. And it shocks me. And so I begin to pray, and you know, and, and then I look at, I look at the perspective of who we are, who we're supposed to be, all right, in God's house as God's people. Okay, I mean, the thing is this, y'all, nobody makes us serve God. 
Nobody forces us. It's a personal choice every day. By all means, you have to choose. The Bible says it's clearly. It says, choose you this day. I Meaning every day is a choice. Alright, so... So here we are in history in America right now. 2012, May 27th. Alright. And look at what's going on around us. We've got... Uh, the, the the anger and the hate and the murder and the and the different things that consistently seem to get progressively worse. You know, it's like it's, it's like if you stand up for even right, you don't have to mention God. You don't have to mention Scripture. If you stand up for right, someone's lying. You catch them, or is there your friend, or they're a partner you work with, and they want to fib something. Well, man, don't do that. It's an automatic hate. It's an automatic despising. All right, if you stand up and you say just simply quote a scripture, I mean, just intense. Just they despise you, and it's like, man, you know, if you stand up for right, they all what do they say? Oh, you're just trying to be this, this, that, and the other. When really you're not, you're just standing up for the right thing. So all these things have been weighing heavy on my heart. You know, we live in a free society. You know, uh, to a certain extent, that is. They're being taken away daily, but for what we know, we live in a free society, and it gives us the options to choose. You're right or wrong. I mean, every day. And with those options to choose is a great responsibility. You know, for instance, I mean, we all know, you know, they have abortion clinics through town and through America. It's legal. You know, um, millions murdered. More than the Holocaust of children, you know, and and if you and if you look and you read, they justify it by saying, well, it's not a child of a certain ex ex age time frame. So it's untrue. If you read from Scripture, you recognize that at the moment of conception, that that person has their own identity. Okay, scientifically, all right. M you know, much more on a spiritual note, obviously, and it's accepted. I guess accepted. I I um I was going to the doctor with Shelly one day when right across when she was pregnant for Shelly and right across the street uh, is it was actually an abortion clinic and I didn't know this at the time and so I'm I'm sitting up and I'm waiting inside and I just look through the windows outside and I'm like what are these two there's two guys outside not not doing anything crazy they were sitting had lawn chairs on the sidewalk and uh, they were sitting there, and, and every time a car would go in, they would try to pass out a flyer or, or this, that, and the other and try to talk. And I, I, obviously, I got it. I said, oh, okay. I read the sign and what, what was going on. And it's an abortion clinic, you know. The option to choose. And do they choose the right or wrong way? So, you know, and, and all the different things. I mean... You will, we will as a society, as people, will never be able to change until you recognize where you are. Okay? If a man, if a man is in water and he's drowning and does not recognize why he's drowning, a physical example, if he doesn't recognize that he's drowning, well then if I throw something to him to save him, it's going to be foreign to him. He's going to reject it. Let's read this in Scripture. Actually, uh, let me let me expound a little bit more on this perspective. So, let's go to this story, Solomon. This is, the context of this story is um, Solomon's building the temple. Solomon was David's son. We all remember David who killed Goliath. All right, Solomon was building the temple. God gave it to his command to build the temple for him. So they built this temple. Uh, you know things from across the world to build this temple and they made it specifically how God wanted it. And if you read in chapter 6 on into 7, it is Solomon praying and it is Solomon seeking God's face for us. Or for for His people at the time. And it was... It was not just any generic prayer. God, send your presence. God, you know, this is your ark. Here it is. There was specifics to it. And when you get time, read it. I'll, I'll, I'll paraphrase and sum it up. But essentially what was going on is Solomon was searching his heart. He was searching his heart of his people, of the land, of the culture, of what was going on. 
He began to search his heart. He began to pray. What we would call it today, or what I see it as, is repentance, meaning returning to God. Meaning, we've been going this such a way for such a long time, and then we recognize, and then we start going back this way towards God. So, all these prayers beforehand, before Second Chronicles 7.14, were a crying out to God. They were a searching of His heart, a searching of His people that He was in charge of. He was the leader. All right. So he prayed all these things. He said, Lord, if we've done this, Lord, if we've done that, Lord, even in not knowing, if we've done these things, God, forgive us. Cleanse us. All right. Let's go now to 714. God then responds. Verse, let's actually start in verse 12. It says, The Lord appeared to him at night and said, I have heard your prayer. And have chosen this place for myself as a temple for sacrifices. When I shut up the heavens so that there is no rain, or command locusts to devour the land, or send a plague among my people. Verse 14. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray, and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Jason, cut, cut these lights on right behind you, please. And, I mean, we've all heard this Scripture. We've all heard that Scripture before. I've heard it before. And, and it's a lot of times people say it in context and in response to recognizing what's going on around them. I simply want to break it down this morning. No, it won't take long. And just expound on what God was saying here. Because God responded to Solomon. This was God's response. After he had prayed all these things and had searched his heart. Okay? Verse 14, I want to break it down. We'll start from here. If my people who are in my name. God clarifying and saying, You must be my people. You must be my people. Called by my name. He wasn't talking to anybody, he wasn't talking to all the cultures around him. He's saying, My people who are called by my name. Literally given the name of God. Okay? No longer just just mimicking steps, but literally given His name. If my people who are called by my name... And I'll ask you this this morning. Are you God's? Only you know, and only you can seek Him out. Nobody else can. Nobody can do it for you. Are you God's? <clears throat> See, this is the thing, guys. God doesn't... The, the words we say... I mean, in, in natural thought, alright? In the life we live today. If I told somebody something and then did something else, well, then what I just said was pointless. I mean, I, I really didn't mean it. I just was saying something. It says in Joel 2.14, it says this, it says, Rend your heart and not your garments. God was talking to His people. Us. Okay? He was talking to Israel back then, but His Word is for us today. It is through the ages and societies. He said, Rend your hearts and not your garments. Does anybody know what that means? Rend your heart and not your garments. Meaning, meaning when you rent, many times they would rent their garments. Okay? They would rent them in two. They would, the sorrow would come upon them. Something grieving would happen. They would tear their garments to show the significance of the grieving process that they were going through. All right? God said, look, He said, you know what? He said, don't just rent or tear your garment to show your reaction. Rent your heart. Meaning, search your heart. Meaning, look inside of your heart. Don't just rend your clothes as an outward appearance, but go internal and rend your heart to me, not your garment, not just something physical that people can see. All right, verse 14 again. We'll humble themselves and pray. Let me ask you this. This is a simple thought, too. Y'all doing okay? Everybody good? All right, good. Let me ask you this, a simple thought. 
If you think you're right, will you ever change? It won't happen. If I think I'm right, then what's the point of looking for another option? I'm right. Right? I mean, you tell me such and such, well, no, I don't believe that because I'm right. So I'm not, gonna, I'm not even listen to or entertain what you're saying. Will humble themselves. Will say, wait a minute, let me step back and let me let go of what I entertain as correct and let me rend my heart to God and let me consider what He says and put my thoughts to the side. Rend my heart and not my garments. Will humble themselves. God, what does it say in Scripture? We've read it. James, God resists the proud. He gives grace to the humble. Meaning, he literally, he literally will, he will literally stop the things you do and resist the things you are trying to accomplish. Simply, he, he can't he can't work with it because you know he can't work with the heart mentality because it won't yield to what he says. It is a resistance to him and his work and his voice. They will humble themselves. They will get down on bended knee. They will begin to search their hearts. Alright, so I go to bed at night, every night. Yes, I do go to bed at night. That's a good thing. But at night, I, I've, uh, and of course, I'm sure a lot of people, I think about what happens through the day. You know, I'm rambling through the thoughts. I'm, I'm doing this, that, and the other. I'm, I'm thinking about all kinds of stuff. It's the same principle as that, uh, as, as thinking, you know, what happened today? What did I do today? It's the same thing at night, searching your heart, saying, God, presenting to Him God as anything grieved you? Has anything today broken your heart? Has anything going against you? Because if it's not for Him, it's against Him. Okay? So, the humility process is not a false humility. Oh, I'm so humble. Let me help you with this. It's not the workings before man or person. Humility is the attitude of the heart that, Lord, if there be anything in me, search my heart. And pray. It says, well, humble themselves and pray. What is prayer? So simple. It's so simple, but so true and so neglected. Prayer is simply speaking to God by faith. That's all prayer is. When we pray, when we pray on stage, when we pray before we go and, and pass out Bibles, when we pray when things come our way, when difficulties come, we're not just rambling on. And not just you know saying something out in the open so it can sound good, maybe we'll feel better. No, when we pray, we're directly speaking to a living God if you have faith and believe in Him. That's what prayer is. Look at, for example, in Scripture, Elijah, after the demonstration of God showing Himself strong on Mount Carmel, all right? The fire came down and consumed the sacrifice. It was, a, it was literally a battle, okay? Where... God was put on display and said, look, Elijah came forth, he was God's prophet. Said, look, if God is real, he'll show himself to be real. And he did. And he consumed the sacrifice. Well, at that time, there was a drought in the land. Okay? And God spoke to Elijah and said, go pray. Okay, that the drought will be released. So, Elijah goes and prays seven times. On seven times, he prayed. He sent his servant and said, Do you see rain cloud? I mean, when there was no rain, I mean there was no rain. There was no clouds. There was nothing for three and a half years. I don't see anything, Elijah. Okay. Then he began to pray again. Go see. Go check. Go see if there's any clouds. Not a thing, Elijah. And he, began to, he did this seven times until he saw way off in the distance a cloud that symbolized the coming rain. And he knew it was going to occur. If he had only done it once... And if it was only rambling, nothing would have happened. But he was directly communing to a living God. And seek my face. Prayer and seeking his face. Literally looking. Literally, okay, we seek something that's lost. I have misplaced my keys, my phone, and several other items all the time. All right? I constantly have to look for them. All right, I'm seeking them out. I, I, I've got to find them, or obviously I can't start the truck up, right? So I look until I find them. And it's the same principle with God. We seek Him until we find Him. 
And we seek His face. Face, okay? Significant that it is, it is the, the literal portrayal, it is the essence of who that person is. Not their hand, not their foot, not their arm, their face. Direct communication with them. And turn from their wicked ways. And turn from their wicked ways. So there's a process here that God was saying. God spoke this. He knew what He was saying. He knew the steps that were needed. And turn from their wicked ways. Alright? What does it say in Scripture? If you know to do right and you don't do it, it's sin. At that point. Because you've had knowledge of the truth and you've rejected it. If you didn't have any knowledge of the truth, it wouldn't be sin. Jesus said that Himself. Pharisees and Scriptures, they said, Oh, look, hey man, hey Jesus, we, we nah, that's not us, we don't, we don't need that. Or, we know this, or, we haven't sinned, God. He said, I tell you what, I tell you what, you see, you know, I see, I know what's going on. He said, well, I'll tell you what, you don't see, and you don't understand. When God shows us, when God, when God literally pricks our heart, all right. I mean, we've all felt bad. We've all said something, put our foot in our mouth. <laughs> we've all said something, done something. We're like, that was stupid. Yep, yep, right there. That was dumb. We recognized it, right? We recognize it, and when then once we recognize it, we can go back. That's simply turning from what you did and going the right way. That's what Jesus said right here. He said, turn from your wicked ways. Turn from those things. He said, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. He will hear. These things occur before. Okay? This is a logical... This is a step by step. This happens, then this happens, then this happens, then this happens. And then, I will hear from heaven and forgive their sin and will heal their land. When Jesus' sin, and this is something that I really feel is, is not understood, and I don't understand it fully, by no means am I saying that, but this is something I do know. Sin and sickness is directly related. Okay? Because the, the, the presence of sin, all right, which is disobedience, which is separation from God, all right, is a direct connection, all right, because it's of Satan to sickness. That's why many times when Jesus forgave them, he healed them as well, because the two could not coexist because of who he was, because of what he had just worked there. And so, therefore, he will heal their land. What did that mean? What was he saying? I mean, we all know natural things droughts, you know, famines, wars, uh, plagues these different things, the physical land is affected. Drought. Obviously the grass doesn't grow. Nothing grows. There's no rain. There's no water. He will heal their land. And that's what the Lord spoke to my heart. Is this scripture right here. It's for us to begin to search our hearts. And I am not above anything. I only speak His Word. I, I, I pray that I adhere it. Okay? I'm a man. I'm a human being, just like anyone else. I need His mercy and grace daily. I must. It's a, it's a choice every day. But He spoke this to me. He said, tell them this. And, guys, there must be a recognition you must recognize where you are before you go anywhere. If you don't recognize, you're not going to make any decision. You'll stay where you are. And that recognition truly comes when you begin to open your heart up to God. But as far as I was talking in the beginning of society of where we're at today, I've just got to expose some things from Scripture that I see is, is a must-see, is a must-understand. 
All right. It says in Hosea four six, it says this: My people perish for lack of knowledge. My people perish for lack of knowledge. What does that mean? If you don't know the answers on the test, you will not pass it. Okay? You didn't know it, so therefore you didn't pass it. Okay? Well, guess what? The ultimate and greatest test is who you will serve. Okay? Because contrary to a lot of different beliefs and religions, you will live after you die eternally somewhere. It is evident in Scripture. It's evident. My people perish for lack of knowledge. They simply did not know. Isn't that crazy? They, they simply they went down the wrong, wrong route because they didn't even know. It's not that their hearts were wicked. It's not that they, oh, I hate God, I hate God. They just didn't even know. How are we going to know what we do unless we go and we read this. God's letter of instruction. Truth, love, forgiveness, grace. On and on and on and on. You could put everything to it. If you don't know it. I get in conversations with people all the time over different variety of topics and things. And guys, if I didn't know God's Word and what it said, I couldn't even respond to them. Or it would just be a topical response. It would just be, oh, this, 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 and that. But it wouldn't be truth. And it would affect nothing in their lives. It says this, and I want to turn to Jeremiah, if you'll turn there with me. Jeremiah chapter 14. I'm sorry guys, I don't, I'm, I'm not a PowerPoint kind of guy. I apologize. I'm just, I read it up here and y'all listen. Anyways, it says this, Jeremiah 14. He was talking that God's, Jeremiah was God's prophet. He said this, he was talking to his people. Jeremiah 14, 14, it says this, The Lord said to me, The prophets are prophesying lies in my name. I have not sent them, or appointed them, or spoken to them. They are prophesying to you false visions, divinations, idolatries, and delusions of their own minds. Jeremiah 23, 30. It says this, Jeremiah 23.30, it says, Therefore declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who steal from one another words supposedly from me. Yes, declares the Lord, I am against the prophets who wag their own tongues, and yet declare the Lord declares. Indeed, I am against those who prophesy false dreams, declares the Lord. They tell them and lead my people astray with their reckless lies, yet I did not send them or appoint them. They do not benefit these people in the least. In terms of God's people today, guys, there are people going around at all times saying things. And, of course, obviously there's a gift of prophecy. There is. It says in Scripture, which is their foretelling. You see something. Okay? But they're saying things that God says, I didn't even give this to them. They're wagging their own tongues. They're, they're going between one another and saying, oh, you said that? Oh, I'm going to say this when God didn't even give it to them. Well, Jeremy, I mean, how do you know? I mean, did God speak it to you? Anything that's spoken, it does not matter what point, time frame in history or who it's spoken to. If it does not line up with Scripture, then it doesn't matter what's said. It doesn't matter. God could speak something to Rick right now. Okay? Now, it might be personal, but guess what? regardless of personal or open, if it didn't line up with Scripture, and I don't thoroughly research it, then it was not of God. And that person, whether on purpose or accidentally, spoke something that was not of Him. And you better throw it away fast. Because it's false. And if you follow falsehoods, you go the wrong way. I'm talking about God's people. you got people, guys, on TV, and in churches all across town, and all across this country, and even in other different parts of the world. They're saying things. Repetitive, mechanical, religious things. And some things just out of the blue that had nothing to do with God. And they don't line up. Why? Because I know them. Because I know the person they spoke to. Not necessarily. But because I know His Word. If it doesn't line up... Well, it was a personal word, Jeremy. How do you know? Everything lines up with His Word. If it contradicts in any way, it's not Him. 
Well, Jeremy, I mean, how do you know? I'd better read His Word. And I better pray. My people perish for lack of knowledge. If I came up and said something to Rick, this is what the Lord says. And my God, I pray I never say it unless it is really what He said because then I'm going to be held accountable. But if I went up to him and I said that, and Rick didn't know the Word of God. Rick's not a scholar. He didn't go to Bible college, but he simply researches it and studies it. If he did not know God's Word and what it said, in context as a whole book, not one verse pulled out of somewhere, whole thing backing up, if he didn't know, he would accept it. And it wouldn't even be of God necessarily. Or it might be of God. That's why he has to know God's Word. But guys, you got people, listen, listen carefully. And someone comes to you and says, this is what the Lord says. Listen very carefully. Because you will know here, and we will know here, if it's of Him. And if it's not of Him, you don't have to get all right, all right and crazy. Okay, I'm not accepting that. That wasn't of Him. And if God tells you to say something back, then say it. It's all about being led by God. It says this, 2 Corinthians 7 1. <clears throat> says this. I'm turning there, I didn't memorize this one. It says, Since we have these promises, and if you read before, everything's in, in sequence, alright? It's backing up. Paul's writing a book, it's going in order, alright? It's talking about do not be un, uh, yoked with unbelievers, do not be a part of this world. It says. Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Guys, for such a long time, I was, and it was just not even necessarily my fault. It was just what was taught. That holiness is somehow connected to the works you do. It is not. Because either your righteousness is by faith, and you believe that He did it regardless of what you've done. Uh, oh, I didn't lie today, so therefore I'm righteous. Or it's not. But watch this. This is something interesting I see on the same note on the other side of that coin. It says, Since we have these promises, dear friends, let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. Let us purify ourselves. When God speaks to your heart, I'm about to fall. When God speaks to your heart, okay? When God shows you something, do you have that choice after that? You must decide what you're going to do. He was saying you have a, a physical choice. Okay, Lord, you're watching something. I, I'm not going to lie, guys. I've been watching stuff before. I'm just like, man, turn that junk off right now. Because that, man, it's like, man, that is just, it, it just hits me, right? I'm like, man, I don't want that in my house. I just, you know, I don't freak out. I'm just like, man, I don't, you know, turn that off. It's not right. What I've heard, or what I've come across, with the things in our lives. When God shows us, we have a choice. It is then our choice. Yes, it's righteousness by faith, but we have a choice after that to decide, now how will I live once I know the truth? That's what he's talking about. Make a constant choice to obey and abide by God's principles once you know the truth. Um, Ephesians 1.18 <clears throat> Paul is talking in Ephesians about the spirit that lives inside of us. Okay? It says this. It says, I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which He has called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in the saints, and His incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of His mighty strength, which He exerted in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and seated Him at His right hand in the heavenly realms. That Spirit that rose Christ from the dead, if you are His, it dwells in you. You are alive and you are quickened. You, you're, you're not this, this little... For instance, I was actually reading uh, this past weekend the story of David. And we've all heard David and Goliath. You know, David you know, walks out, you know, Goliath, you're going to die. And he does and he chops his head off and you know, we walk away from it. But if you read... If you read, all right, if you read in the context of David, he walked out under some influence, not of himself, okay? He's a teenager, all right? Daniel, how old are you? 
13. 13, 14, 15, somewhere. He's a teenager. He's a giant, literally. I mean, by man's standards. I mean, mud's lying 9, 10 foot tall. I mean, just tall. Craziness. Big old boy, right? David walked out not under his own influence. He didn't walk out because, you know, I just feel like showing what I got. He walked out under God's Spirit. And he told this, this giant that had come against their land and said, No, my God will destroy you today. It's not me. My God will. He will give me into your hands under God's Spirit. The same Spirit that dwells in us if we believe in Him. Ephesians 5.14 I'm almost through, guys. It says this. It says, Wake up. This is actually a prophecy that Paul was talking in Ephesians. Uh, verse 4, it says, For it is light that makes everything visible. That is why it is said, Paul is quoting a prophecy, Wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Wake up. When you're awake, you can see. If I'm asleep, I don't know what's going on around me. Wake up. When the light of God's truth hits your heart, you have no choice. You must respond. And last, Revelations 3, verse 18. This was the letters to the churches. Seven letters to the churches. <clears throat> it says this. This was the, the angel of the Lord talking to John. John's, uh, he's out in prison on an island for God's name. He said, write this down. He said, I counsel you, tell God's people this. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. He was saying, look guys, you say, because in, in previous of the same letter, they were, God's people will come saying, I can see, I'm fine. I've got plenty of money. But Jesus said, hey, look, you're really blind and naked and you can't see. You're broken down. But you think you've got it together. He said, I'll tell you, this is what you need to do. You know, the, the thing is this. If God's Word is not spoken His love, all right, and His truth, there's no point because He can't speak outside of who He is. He is love. So everything I spoke to you today was, man, it was not condemnation. It was not in any way, shape, or form coming against us. I just spoke these things because we have to recognize them. Society, culture. I mean, even, even to what our president said. I affirm sin. We know what he said. But what he said is, I affirm sin. Oh, it's not sin and you know God was born this way. And Man, if you read Scripture, not me. Don't take me and rely on it and go off of it. If you read Scripture, it says everything, plain and clear. God's heart and what God desires. And not one sin is unforgivable, except unless you blaspheme the Spirit. All right. So all these things I said to you, Second Chronicles seven fourteen. The whole gist of what I was saying was this: recognize where we are, our country, our society, the state of our heart, God's people, God's people, where we are as a people, as a society. You know, Jesus said this. He said, "The greatest among you will be your servant." But today it's taught: it's all about you. It's your best life right now. Go get it. It's fun. It's exciting. Not that I don't enjoy to fish or have fun in life, guys, alright? But when the perspective is literally all enjoyment and no take up and carry your cross, then that perspective is wrong. Alright? Recognize the things around us so that the change may begin. Because our country, guys, our country, where we are, is on a slope downhill. Fast. Quick, fast, in a hurry. And God's people perish for lack of knowledge because they don't even know what His Word says. When God speaks His Word, search your heart and let Him speak. And He'll begin to change you and show you. If you love Him. I mean, if you don't love Him, I mean, it's understandable. I mean, it's understandable. You and not, I mean, there's no desire to do it. If you do it all based off of a mechanical law, oh, got to do it, got to do it, got to do it, well, then that's no relationship. I mean, might as well not even do it either. I mean, that's, that's quite boring. But I recommend because you love God, do these things and the things I spoke today. Let them speak to your heart. Amen. Y'all alright? Good. Well, let's pray uh, real quick. 
Um, any any prayer requests? Anything we need to lift up and pray? Anything we need to pray about? Anything? Anything? <laughs>